Thanks, Al. Maybe a little less ridiculous than the first. Um, uh, Al said to me before I came in here, why would anybody do this, um, banning the bypass? So I hope to explain it a little bit um, and show you. Um, can I control this? Green dot, got it, thank you. You'd think I'd know by now. Um, so gastric bypass is currently the most frequently performed procedure in the world. The numbers I came up with were about 344,000 cases for, of bariatrics worldwide and about half of that gastric bypass. But it has a failure rate depending on what you read, what patients you start with, et cetera, especially if the BMI is higher of up to 40%. I think 15% is a number that I think uh, fits pretty well for me and, and how you define failure. BMI doesn't get under 35 or less than 50% excess weight loss. And certainly if you start with a BMI over 50 population, you're going to be worse off. Um, so what are the mechanisms of action of gastric bypass? And we've learned some about this, but I, I still think the answer to this is we have no idea. But you can argue with that. Um, certainly there's some restriction, as Dean just showed. A lot of that restriction decreases over time. My bias is that most of that loss of restriction is due to stomal dilatation. There's malabsorption, but many studies have shown that there's very little malabsorption of calorie intake, that most of the malabsorption, if at all, is a little bit of fats. Um, Dr. Uh, Pomp was involved in some of that work. And what we think we know is that there's hormonal induction of satiety, all these wonderful hormones, some of which I've been involved in studying, PYY, GLP-1, but some of the studies out there in animals where they have knockout mice for PYY, GLP-1, ghrelin, the knockout mice lose just as much weight after a gastric bypass as the wild type mice. So it's not totally clear that we understand any of this. But for our own simplistic way of thinking about it, I think for now this is what we imagine is working. So why do pa patients gain weight? Certainly there can be technical problems with the operation, the gastrogastric fistula we know. I think pouch and stoma dilatation is one of the things that we as surgeons can control. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit more, but you know, this is a disease that is very resistant. It's a chronic disease, and in some patients it's not due to hunger. In some patients it's due to other behaviors. Patients are eating to self-medicate, especially with carbs. And when Al talks about you give them more restriction, all they do is go with soft, high-calorie liquids. For sure, um, there are some patients that are going to do that, but not everyone. Weight regain over time, you know, it's hard to pick this up, but uh, a couple of papers show that over 10, 15 years, patients are gaining back 10%, a little bit more than 10% of their body weight loss. But this is an average for the group. And there's some people that'll have a straight line maintaining almost all their weight loss, and some people that gain back a significant amount. We don't have good definitions for what is significant weight regain. You can talk about 25 or 30% of your excess weight loss, or did you ever lose 50%? You know, it, it's tough to know exactly. Fortunately, insurance companies deal with most of this for us because they're not going to let us reoperate on patients who aren't back to a BMI of 35 or 40, depending on their comorbidities. So oftentimes, patients come to the office, and I've been doing this for 20 years. Patients come back 12 years later saying, I was great for seven or eight years. I maintained my weight. Whatever happened, um, I've regained a whole lot of it now, and I want something done. I can't deal with this anymore. Um, and we know that all revisional operations, for the most part, have an increased rate of, rate of complications. So. Revisions for gastric bypass have been mostly focused on if there's a really giant pouch, reducing the pouch size. Definitely you've seen about reducing stoma size and limb lengths. We've gone to distal bypass. Um, these are the reported um, procedures that have been used for revision for the most part. Um, distal bypass has a very high incidence of malnutrition and, and reoperation. In my early series of this, we, I think it was 25% of the patients that we operated on had to be revised um, for malnutrition in the first year. Um, TPN multiple times, et cetera. The conversion to BPD might be a little bit better than that, but it's a very complex operation with a fairly high complication rate, at least in my experience. And pouch and stoma revision, which people talk about, go back and trim the pouch and redo the anastomos and all that, pretty much leads you to the same place you were before, several studies have shown. Um, we did some, a study back when with a randomized patient, a banded versus a standard gastric bypass. The band was a, about a one centimeter diameter piece of Marlex, actually, and showed that in BMI over 50 patients, we actually got better weight loss, almost to the same weight loss as we got in our BMI under 50 patients with gastric bypass. So the idea came, well, if that's working for our super obese patients as a primary procedure, perhaps going back and doing this for the super obese that regained weight would um, be valuable. So we started way back when, in probably 2002, using adjustable band as a revision for our failed gastric bypass. And compared to the revision we were doing then, which was a distal bypass with a high, high need for reoperation rate, um, this is relatively safe and simple, it seemed, and gave us, would give us a permanent reduction of stoma size and pouch size, as long as the band stayed in place. I, maybe permanent is not the right word. 
Of course, all the disadvantages of banding and then some might apply. But it was a lot simpler than what we were doing for patients with, you know, make, making them into a distal bypass or, you know, trying to revise staple lines and stomas, et cetera. So the first time this is ever reported in the literature was actually Paul O'Brien reported on band as a revision of previous bariatric procedures in general. They reported, I think, on 20 some odd patients, only two of whom had had gastric bypass, but to give credit where credit is due, he, he did this first and gave no specific data for the gastric bypass patients. We reported on an N of 15 back in 2005, and these are the patients we started doing in 2002, um, where we saw weight loss that was very similar to the weight loss we saw when we placed the band as a primary operation. So about 40 some odd percent excess weight loss. Um, so we brought all these patients in, who, you know, gastric bypass at that point, I'd been doing it for long enough that there were patients coming back asking for something. Um, and we would educate them and replete their vitamins because a lot of them had been non-compliant and make them come back for a while. And bottom line is we put them on meds, we'd get them exercising again, and most of them didn't lose a significant amount of weight. I think their metabolic rate is so slowed down at that point, but they, they really struggled. And so we started offering these patients um, initially under IRB protocol, we're no longer doing it that way, um, placement of adjustable band around the gastric pouch. I'll talk about the technique a little bit, and I'll show a brief video in a second, but the main thing is that, you know, there's going to be adhesions from the prior surgery. We were mostly at the beginning doing patients who had had open surgery years prior, before the laparoscopic year, and now it's gotten a little simpler. Um, and I think the most important thing here is dissection of the angle of hiss at the left cruise of the diaphragm and then fixation of the band. Those two points I want to make a few times over and over again. That, that angle of hiss neighborhood where the proximal end of the gastric pouch staple line is, is usually stuck like cement to the left cruise of the diaphragm. And one of my partners um, years ago got within a few weeks, two gastrotomies at that point, one recognized, one unrecognized, and placed the band. It's really, and he was good, um, you know, just, this is a difficult spot. And then fixation of the band, I know people are doing bands without fixation, but this thing sits, I don't know if I can do this in mouse here, no. So this thing sits right above the gastrojejunostomy, and really having a foreign body sitting on the small bowel, bad idea, my opinion, I don't have proof per se, um, we'll talk about it a little bit more. And so. Fixing this by taking the bypassed portion of the stomach, unless you have a very, very big pouch, and using the bypassed portion of the stomach to placate both below and above the band, so you're patching over the front of the band with the bypassed stomach, um, was, was the concept that we used. And hopefully this video will play. So here's a patient, you know, take down adhesions for a little while. This is a laparoscopic patient, so there's not much in the way of adhesions. Um, and then, you know, you gotta free up your pouch to the angle of hiss. Um, some of the open procedures we did, you could spend, you know, two hours digging this stuff out, and, and a lot of those were retrogastric, um, as was this patient, a patient of mine, because that's the way I do it. And so finding that uh, gastrojejunostomy um, is important, too, because you don't want to be putting this on the jejunum or over the gastrojejunostomy. You need a little bit of space, and I'm sorry for this, it's going to pop through. But this is where it can be really difficult, right, right in there, and you got to really, that, that's not the oh, way to do it. Well, you, you know, you got to just be careful. Um, and then you place the band around. Now, you can see um, the jejunum there is really just going to be a centimeter below the band. I, I guess I can't point to it, but right there I point to it. It's, it's really just there. And if you don't do something to stop that jejunum from being where the band is, it's going to be a problem, I think. So we always endoscope these patients and see where the band is sitting relative to the gastrojejunostomy. And here you can see suturing of the bypass stomach over there on the right side of the screen below the band and then sutures of that same portion of stomach a centimeter more proximal above the band and fixation of the band so it doesn't get onto the jejunum. If I have time at the end of the talk I have another video that goes through this a little bit more. And this is what it looks like on x-ray afterwards, you know, esophagus, gastric pouch um, and uh, rule limb just underneath and you can see they're pretty close together. This band may not be perfectly placed. This band may have a, this patient may have a small hiatal hernia there. I think correcting the hiatal hernias and keeping the bands with a relatively small pouch as high away from the jejunum as possible is a really good idea. Um, and then we published a paper, I think it was in 2010, um, on what I believe was 28 patients. I'm, I'm blanking on the number now. We might stay in there, 22 patients. Um, eligible for follow-up at three months, and we had pretty good follow-up all the way through, better than the follow-up of most of our patients, so I gotta say, out to five years. And we saw about the same as we did in our initial study. So out to five years, we were seeing 47% excess weight loss, 57% for the combined gastric bypass that they had had, plus their um, band now. You could see where patients started. And so I think we're, we're seeing some durable results. 
uh, with this. And we don't have a ton of patients out to five years. We can update this and have some more. But um, basically, 53% of excess weight loss from the combined procedures, and you saw there a, a big portion of that was from the band. Um, they've had an average of four adjustments. I will say that these patients end up pretty tight. They really want that restriction. Um, we've had one slippage and one erosion to date. Um, we actually fixed the slip because she refused to let me take the band out by putting Marlex to hold the band in place. So far, so good. It's that she's four or five years. She's four years out now. Um, and I don't know what's going to be with that. But again, I'm, I'm putting Marlex around the stomach for, for you know, banded bypass as well. So I'm kind of comfortable with that. But I know a lot of people will think that's crazy. Um, not the first crazy thing I've done, as Alphonse told you. Um, so um, this paper was published by Guy et al., um, Looking at everything that's been published in literature, I think this was in 2012, um, so seven studies in literature, and that's about it so far. So we don't have a ton of patients. If you look at the N over there, I think we're looking at 94 patients. Um, and initial BMIs that are you know pretty high up there, um, and BMIs at revision, um, you could see were very, very variable, but the patients who started in the BMI 50s don't end up with BMI under 40 um, nearly as often. And you could see the excess weight loss varies, you know, 60% in some studies to 28%, but some of these studies had you know, less than a year follow-up and really banding, you need to give them two years till you get sort of to their plateau. So hard, I think, I think you know, 40% is probably a reasonable number to expect, and I think that's what's reasonable to expect from a band in the first place. Yeah, sure, some are gonna see 70, most are gonna see a lot less. And this is it from that paper showing the uh, percent excess weight loss from those seven studies. Uh, they're really six because two of them are combined together. Um, we're split up in that graph. Um, unfortunately, in, in the literature, you take these 94 patients and 18% of them had uh, complications, and this follow-up is less than two years. So that's a pretty high complication rate. Um, now, some of them were hernias because they were done open in one of the studies, but two slips and two erosions. And that's pretty high, in my experience, for the first two years after a band. And I know, like I say, my partner who had two gastric perforations that's not published, um, and I know uh, one intraluminal migration that was pulled out of the um, small bowel uh, a few years after uh, uh, being placed. So potential advantages is technically simpler than other strategies. It's, I think you know, no argument is going to be safer than other strategies as far as major complications up front. Um, but these are often non-compliant patients. It, they're not going to have their um, metabolic sequelae necessarily followed well with some of these distal procedures. And, um, it doesn't really burn any bridges. Disadvantages, I think that you know fixation is a potential problem and the slippage rate is probably gonna be higher, the erosion rate is probably gonna be higher, and the intraoperative complication rate is probably going to be higher. Um, I'll let this run, for, it, it's actually about a two minute video if you wanna let it go or not, but it, this is a little bit um, different procedure we, it, than, the, than the one shown prior, a little bit more um, dissection and a little bit more pouch here. In this procedure, you can see the pouch is being held in the grasper on the right. There's actually enough pouch to placate over the band with the pouch. And I think this is really a, a good, you see how far away the jejunum is um, down. There's a very long pouch, but with a big piece of fundus that was left on it. Right. I don't think we need to go any further than that, actually. Um, I have a question. Please. Regarding your, uh, the pre-op assessment, when you assess for uh, pouch size for uh, rapid transit, um, can you, um, have you seen any correlation of better results if it's rapid transit versus in a large pouch? So um, we get an upper GI and endoscopy on all these patients. I want to know the length of the pouch because I won't offer it to anybody that has a less than three centimeter long pouch. Um, they all transit rapidly. I, I haven't seen a patient who didn't just fly through um, that we've done this for. And I think that's probably true though of all patients. Mm -hmm. A couple of years after gastric bypass, you give them a liquid you know, thing, it's going to go flying right through. And I don't know why some patients need the restrictions and some patients don't. Um, the very giant pouches, you know, I, again, you can reduce those with this too, but I think those patients might benefit from a, a, a real pouch reduction, you know, surgically. It's just the complication rate is so much higher stapling that pouch again than putting a band on top of it. Okay, I'm going to start with that side and then I'm going to work my way around. So you're first. Who are you? What's your question? I'm Dr. Zarar. Uh, don't you think you're putting gastrogastric uh, stitches, inviting for the gastrogastric fistula? Well, there's because seromuscular the sutures. Those so two. Repeat. Okay, sorry, I'll repeat the question. Everybody understood the question. I, I think the question was, do I think that those gastrogastric sutures are inviting gastrogastric fistulas? So what I'll say is there's seromuscular bites. Those two things are sitting right next to each other already. Anyway, they both had staple lines on them, so they were, and didn't fistulize before. I haven't seen it. But that's a great question. Back. 
Jamie Loggins out of Maine. I noticed in your illustration, at least, it looked like you placed that band right over the previous gastric staple line. Any concern with implanting that bladder over mechanical staple sitting there and bladder rupture or anything like that? Yeah, okay, I, I th if I get the question, I think the band over the staple line from the pouch, is that a concern? Right. And yeah, I guess it is, um, except for that th that's healed. It's been years um, healed over and the erosion rate is higher. I think it's because it's sitting on the anastomosis more than it's sitting on top of the staple line, but who knows where it's eroding in the few patients that have eroded. So it may be a relative problem, but it's not a huge problem. Um, so in large studies of the band, the erosion rates with a pars placida technique are somewhere around two to three percent. Agreed. Your erosion rate is not greater than that. No, but that's at two years. And I don't so think that's think a fair as, assessment. As time goes on, you might have a little bit more erosion because you see these erosions earlier? Well, I, I think there's going to be an erosion rate that increases over time in bands in general. And, you know, that data you quoted 2% is probably five to seven years of, you know, combined data. And here we barely have, I mean, the mean follow-up in these studies isn't two years. It's less than two years. So right. I think, it, you know, you're getting 100 patients with two in less than two years, you're probably going to have a higher erosion rate, my guess. Hi, Jim McGinty from St. Luke's Roosevelt in New York City. Mark, that probably might have been me holding the camera for you during those uh, <laughs> cases. But I uh, just wanted to know, I think this was uh, related to the question that was just uh, posed, was uh, have you seen any problems, mechanical problems, with the balloon itself deflating as a result of being up against the staple line? Any, any results there I when you go not, to adjust these patients that they're uh, having again, problems? Again, my series of 30-some-odd patients at this point, we haven't seen any balloons pop, if that's what the question is. I think those staples are well incorporated in scar tissue at the time, we're not sort of trying to mess with or beat up those staple lines. Sure, if you can get above the staple line, that's great, but if you've done your gastric bypass well in the first place, your staple line's going up to the angle of hiss, and that's where your band's going to be sitting. Uh, we haven't seen a problem. Thank you. When you're doing this, I notice that a lot of your videos, you're starting at, towards the angle of hiss, and most surgeons who do revisions try and identify the right cruise first. Um, is this just what you showed us or what do you think about yeah, that? I think I'm focused these videos on the problem areas, right? I'm trying to focus the highlights of the thing. I, I, I don't care what I identify first, whether it's the right cruise or the crural fibers. In, in a patient who's at a bypass first, the right cruise is usually virginal and then you find that follow it up around. But yeah. I'm showing the dissection beginning where it's, you know, I need to show the points. Question from the back, please. Alex Sonopchenko from Atlantic City. So Mark, what do you do with these people when they erode? I mean, I've had some bands erode into native stomachs that posed a pretty significant technical problem. Yeah, it, it, like I said, we've had one erosion. I took it out, left a drain, sewed up the hole. They've been fine, except they're missing their band and want something more again. Um, I think that you treat it like any erosion. It's not a high pressure system like banding a sleeve might be, not that I've ever done that or would, but, but with a gastric bypass, it's a fairly low pressure stomach. So I think you're, you're fine to do what you would normally do. Um, like I said, the one I know about that was removed from the small bowel, you know, it eroded all the way through and, and healed up behind it. So these things are sort of magical to me how that all happens. But um, I, I think it's just a band erosion. D does it matter if the original operation was retrogastric or antigastric? Well, the retrogastric ones are more difficult because, you know, digging out that pouch can be more complex. And um, on the other hand, the jejunum tends to be out of the way and you might have a little bit more fixation of that distal stomach. Sometimes I haven't had to do distal sutures because it's been just so fixed, that staple line of the bypass stomach just fused to the front wall of the pouch, and then you just have to do a, a, a sutures above it. Um, and, and endoscopy can be really, really helpful in those cases to identify where the gastrojejunal anastomosis is, which is often behind your bypass stomach. In an anti-colic um, setup, I think you have a little bit more risk for slippage and have to do a lot more fixation. All right, thank you very much.